Hi everyone, Keenan here. I just wanted to make a plug for Anchor, the platform that I use to make this podcast. It's free, it's super easy to create, and anybody can, you know, add anything. You can have background music, songs, sounds, as you know that I have in mind. When I, I listen to some that with like super silly sounds from my friends too. Um, they'll distribute it to everybody too. I, most of my listeners are Spotify or Apple, but they go all over the place. It's really great. It has everything you need. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello again, and welcome to For Whom the Cell Tolls. I'm your host, Keenan, and joining me again in the studio is Scout, my Pomeranian. So today we're gonna to talk about something that is very close to what I do. Essentially, I've titled this episode, Welcome to the Jungle, because Tomb Revolution is not just the story of the cells that are quote unquote malignant. They're really surrounded by an entire environment that is living and breathing around them and all kinds of things, predators, resources, genetic diversity, everything comes back into play. So I'm really excited to go over this today. And this is gonna be, you know, I'll be honest, like if this is your intro to cancer, it's gonna be a pretty big intro, but for the most part, I will try and keep things um, pretty steady. But the story of how we were able to classify tumors now is a really amazing one. Um, and obviously it's a really, really challenging one. So the biggest thing is, I think there's a line from the movie Halloween and it always stuck with me. It's like, it's something about the evil within each, every one of us, blah, blah, blah. And you're talking about Michael Myers and how scary he is. And it's just like, oh, boo. You know, my dad showed me that movie when I was like in fifth grade, I was nightmares over it, terrifying. So the thing is, is that humans have been running all our lives, all, all of our existing lives, you know, for the past thousands of years from foreign invading species, parasites, viruses, bacteria, everywhere. Our immune system is keyed to these things. The challenge with cancer is that cancer cells look almost nearly exactly like our cells. And our immune system is trained to kill and hunt foreign looking things like bacteria because those look different than our cells. Viruses, the proteins on viruses, they're very weird and the immune system gets very triggered and goes after them immediately. Cancer cells are different. They can hide right in plain sight and that is the challenge when it comes to immunology and cancer. So one of the things that I've tried to make the argument for, I probably will never win this argument and I made it in my microbiology class is you know, we talked about viruses being alive, but could we consider a tumor to be alive, like a living thing, like kind of a separate thing? Technically, no, you can. It's it's technically within a person and within a person's their own cells, but to a degree, it's an organism with its own genetics, its own makeup. It's got an agenda, and it will do anything to survive. The biggest thing with tumors and evolution is that it, re it really just paints the clearest possible picture of the process, evolution itself. So if anybody ever asks, well, you know, prove evolution to me, ask if they've ever known anybody to have cancer, did they go in and see the doctor, did the doctor give them chemo, medicine, something, they got better for a bit, they came back, the cancer's back, and they died. This was the natural course for a long time before we were able to come up with therapies, things like what we have now that can reverse this. We can change kind of the table on this. But back then, essentially what you were seeing in tumor evolution was you'd have a tumor and it would be made up of, you know, obviously billions of different cells and each of them, you know, and there was a main population driving the whole tumor, but a lot of times there were smaller subpopulations within the tumor that had different genetic mistakes in them. They had different strengths and weaknesses. So when the tumor first came up, it was being driven by, you know, one gene or, you know, one set of type of genes. When you combat that with medicine, you tampen that down and you kill all those malignant tumors, except for the resistant ones in some cases. And then those ones build back up and now they comprise the population because when they divide, that's essentially making offspring, just like any other species. 
and they're going to take up all the resources and all the space that were left over by that competing species, the original tumor that was killed by the medicine. So this is where, you know, this is, that's, that's evolution in our face and it's killing us. You know, people can get hung up on the theory of evolution, you know, that's fine, but it happens in real time. It's right there and that's it. So another good example of how tumor evolution works is, and we'll touch on this a bit later, is not only sometimes are there resistant clones or resistant cells to begin with, right? Sometimes there is a cell, like an ancestor cell, that's kind of just floating around and it gave rise to the tumor because one of its cell divisions caused one of the cells to be really malignant and go crazy. And then your chemo or your treatment gets rid of all that, all that cell, like all that big malignant mass. But the cell that originally like gave rise to the tumor the first time, that population is still probably running around. The thing is, is that we don't have medicines that target this hidden population. We call these cancer stem cells. And I'll take a lot of crap for calling them that because technically, by all accounts, they're kind of can tumor initiating cells is a better word. But for buzzwords, let's call them cancer stem cells because they can float around only having a few mistakes in their genes, for example. And then they can give rise to a second malignant population. And this time the therapy won't work. That's a different mode of evolution. And both are equally, you know, we... We, we need tools to combat both equally, but it's a really hard battle. So we've covered, you know, why cancer is this challenge and why our immune system is so poor against it, even though actually, you know, we will get into the immunology, immunology itself later. The immune system is actually very powerful against cancer. And the theory of immunosurveillance actually says that our immune system is so sensitive to changes, even on our own cells, that our immune system kills thousands of precancerous cells before they ever become anything bad. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it that our immune system is that powerful that it can detect and hunt down precancerous cells like that. The, the cancerous cells that do end up making it have to be very well hidden or very powerful and able to survive. Hiding is usually a better strategy as you'll see. So there was a great paper by Carlos C. Maley and it was in Nature Reviews. Essentially he broke down a tumor into four different parts, genetic diversity, how its genes, how much genetic like change it occurs and accrues over time. So how like the tumor itself, like how many, how many changes in the genes can it handle the resources around the tumor? And those are blood vessels, um, metabolites, you know, what it has to eat basically, and then hazards. And these are predators. So the picture he's painting here is that Tumors are only themselves half the story. Surrounding environment plays an equally impressive and necessary role. So on one hand, you have the evolution of the tumor, and that's how much genetic diversity it starts with and how fast that can change over time. And then next, you have the ecology of the tumor. Resources, blood vessels, can this tumor engineer signals to cause nutrients to flow towards it? It needs that. And also just as easily, it's being hunted all the time. Don't ever make a mistake. The tumors, even if they're growing and fighting back the immune system, your immune system is trying. It's just been outplayed a little bit. We have certain therapies that give the immune system uh, the advantage again, but we're still learning how, the, how they work. So if we go through these four things, the first thing of the tumor is its genetic diversity. Some tumors are completely the same. They all have the same Basically, they're being driven by the same growth and survival genes. And in a lot of cases, what will happen here is that the medicine will simply work and knock out the entire thing because there were never any cells that had like, you know, a resistant uh, trait. So in that case, that's a good thing for the patient. You want, in a lot of cases, a low genetic diversity. This is the issue with cheetahs is that they're all pretty much the same genetically. So if a disease ever comes through that affects cheetahs, they're all probably going to get it. So that's why their, their population is really fragile. So if it's a tumor, it's a good thing. Cheetahs, bad thing. Change over time. Cancer cells are excellent at incurring more genetic mutations. 
and surviving for it. Oftentimes you'll see defective uh, gene editing proteins in cancer, and then more mutations keep popping up. And if a mutation kills the cancer cell, who cares? There are billions others of others. So this is bad if you have a lot of change over time, because that means that in response to therapy, um, you know, you could, you know, the tumor that is now could be different in a week, especially when you put a therapy in front of it and you start selecting for the, the most resistant cells. And what I mean by selecting is that if you give therapy to a tumor and, you know, it's a highly changeable and mutable one, it's prob some cell in there is going to, you know, have the right combination of mutations to get away. The next, and this is where kind of the jungle comes in, what we call this is the tumor microenvironment. There are all kinds of cells that are corrupted by the tumor, and they have no genetic mistakes. Tumors can engineer the amplification of chemical signals that bring in healthy cells to feed them and to help them and to protect them. I mean, even one of the worst things that tumors do is they form this physical barrier of cells around them called stroma, and your immune cells or therapy can't even get in. This is a huge issue with pancreatic cancer, one of the worst types of cancers. You cannot get therapy in there. It's because it's so thick with just normal cells that the tumor has grown around itself as this shield. So not only are you corrupting normal cells, you're also going to corrupt all kinds of blood vessels to come towards that tumor. There are tons of therapies that address this. Um, they're, they're pretty good. They're okay. Um, but essentially, tumors engineer your blood vessels to come towards it and feed it oxygen, nutrients, everything it needs. Because remember, these cells are dividing like crazy. You need four things for cells. Nucleic acids for your DNA, lipids for your plasma, bilayer, carbohydrates, and proteins because you are turning over all kinds of stuff. And lastly, my favorite part of the jungle is the hazards, the immune predators. Your T cells, your natural killer cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, they're hunting the tumor the whole time. If you have a if you have a tumor that does not hide from them very well, you're going to have a pretty good prognosis because they're going to find it eventually and they're going to eat it and, you know, kill it off. And now we have all these therapies that are activating the predators. This is very much akin to Basically say, like in Hawaii, for example, there was an issue with invasive species of snakes killing off um, a bunch of like wild birds. So we introduced mongoose to Hawaii, and that's essentially what we do now. We introduce immune therapies that activate the immune predators against the cancer. Didn't work out in Hawaii because the mongoose hunted at night and the snakes hunted at day, so they both killed the chickens. So that was, it was kind of unfortunate. Um, we definitely mess with nature quite a bit. But... The role of a tumor as essentially a parasitic organism inside you, draining your resources while also hiding from those hazards, that's a bad combination. So genetic diversity, change over time, the resources the tumor can get, and how it avoids the hazards around it. And this is, this is essentially disease ecology, and it completely ties back in to pop eco, you know, how evolution works in, in you know, when you've got all kinds of different species and this is where I start, this is where I would start my argument of, you know, a tumor is a living, breathing thing. We have to treat it that way. We can't treat it um, the way I, personally, I don't think we can treat tumors the way that we've tried because we always try to kill it. But the thing is, is that there's always a way around, you know, organisms always find a way to survive. If there ever was, a perfect therapy would be something that kind of made the tumor chronic or domesticated it. That's, you know, my grand idea, that'd be awesome, is that if you had this therapy somehow that whether it was with the immune system or something else, it could essentially stop the tumor from being deadly anymore. It could still exist, but that way what you're doing is you're never selecting for the truly, really bad cells that are in there waiting to be selected for, because that's what a lot of our therapies do. Now, don't get me wrong, especially in my disease and lymphoma, we can actually say cure a ton of the time with standard therapy. And that's one of the things that gets lost a lot of time. There's a ton of cures out there now, and it's really amazing work by everybody on board. It's really cool. So with all this, well, I'm going to transition a little bit. So we are kind of out of the jungle now, so to speak. And we're kind of talking about these therapies again. The scary thing is that a lot of our therapies, especially maybe 10 years ago, 
they didn't target founder populations. And what I mean by founder populations is the very, very first ancestral tumor cells that had the very first set of mistakes. So you need to target these cells because they'll always be there because most of our therapies were just targeting the really aggressive ones that we characterize as cancer. The scariest thing is that, and I just said that, um, is that cells are floating around inside us that have one to two to three genetic mistakes characteristic of many tumors. So we have these cells, you know, just floating around. Nothing's triggered them. No environmental stimuli have caused them to overdrive into cancer. But realistically, they just need a little push. One more mistake. A lot of the times when we'll sequence healthy patients, sometimes we'll find a very characteristic uh, lymphoma oncogene called BCL2 is highly amplified and super big and active in this healthy person's cell, but they don't have lymphoma. So it's all about successive steps and mistakes. Now, this person with BCL2, uh, the amplification, yeah, they probably have that much better of a chance because they just need one to two more mistakes. Say you need three every time. This is where BRCA comes in, where if you have a defective BRCA copy, remember, because you get a copy of every gene, one from mom, one from dad, if you start your life with one down, it only takes one more to get disease, for example, like if that, and that's a tumor suppressor, BRCA is a tumor suppressor that stops cancerous genes from getting overboard. So that's why if you have normal BRCA genes, you have to lose one and two before you're in trouble. If you come into the game with just one, it's a little riskier. So this always kind of reminded me of a line from The Dark Knight where the Joker basically said, yeah, he kind of is talking about his little push or whatever. Let's see, I don't know how this is gonna sound over here. White Knight and I brought him down to our level. It wasn't hard. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> so, he's right. That's the scariest thing about cancer, and I learned this about two years into grad school, is that these founder cells, they're probably inside you, and they're waiting. So, it's never a good time to take up smoking or chewing or anything. And if you do have a relative, that uses tobacco, I do, and I'm trying, and we're actually making some progress there. Um, you are gambling every time. And admittedly, you know, it's a one in a billion mistake, maybe, depending on how many mistakes you want to make, or how many you already were born with, or however many you unluckily already have. So that's how a lot of this evolution works, is that it actually starts very, very far back. And these cells run around and they're kind of just sitting there and eventually something happens and, and that's what we get. Sometimes we actually get a full-blown tumor. So the future is going to target those cells. And I think we're doing a better job of addressing that. My initial boss, um, you know, my first graduate school mentor, he was a huge proponent of what he calls targeting clonality. You need to target these genetic alterations that are 100% clonal. Because if you just go after 60% of what's driving the tumor, you're going to end up with 40% fresh tumor, and that's going to take over even worse. So, really smart guy. Uh, good mentor to, to learn so much from. And I'll leave you with a line that I'll probably address later on too. Humans and cancer are very alike in one way. Most organisms adapt to their environment. Humans adapt the environment to us. Cancer does the same thing. The signals, everything it does, scaring away the immune system, hiding from it, corrupting fresh cells, gaining nutrients. Cancer in humans are the only thing that adapt the environment itself to their goals. We don't have to adapt, you know, to our environment. Same with cancer. Pretty bleak episode, not gonna lie. Um, gonna definitely gonna leave you though that things are always looking on the up and up. I can promise you that. Hundreds of new amazing novel therapies are out there now, and we're really excited to uh, to start bringing this into the fold. 
All right, so some future episodes, um, microbiome, immunology, domestication, smallpox, ethics, CRISPR ethics. We'll definitely have some more in the, in the docket. All right, well, I'll leave you with that. Have a good night and good luck. Scout, you want to say goodbye? Sleeping, I'm sorry. No goodbyes. Maybe someday. Have a good night, everybody.